We're next going to turn to a concept that you know from Econ 101, the concept of a demand curve. So a demand curve tells us for different prices, say of good one, how much of the good one we're going to consume, how much we're going to demand. And such a curve holds everything else fixed. So we would fix the level of income that you have and the prices of other goods and just ask the question as the price of good one changes how will the quantity I demand of x1 change so how would we derive that from what we've done so far well we could start with our consumer diagram where we put x1 on this axis and x2 on this axis and we could start with some initial budget constraint that initial budget constraint has a certain level of income that we're going to hold fixed. It also has a price of good 2 in the slope that we're going to hold fixed. So the slope here is minus P1 over P2, but we're going to hold P2 fixed. We're only going to change P1. We then can start with the optimal consumption bundle on that initial budget line. We can call that the bundle A. And immediately we have one point on the demand curve that holds income fixed and the price of good 2 fixed at these levels. We can simply bring down to the horizontal axis the amount of x1 we're going to consume at bundle A and then bring that down to this graph because we're also measuring x1 on the horizontal axis of a demand curve graph. And then on the vertical axis, that price of good one will be a certain price, so let's suppose that price is here. So then we have one point on our demand curve. It tells us at that particular price, this is how much of the good we're going to consume. Then we can increase the price of good one holding everything else constant, and that'll give us a steeper budget line. So that higher price will appear somewhere above the initial green price. Let's call it P1 prime. And so that new budget constraint is going to have the slope P1 prime divided by P2, which we haven't changed. And ultimately, there's a new optimal consumption bundle on this magenta line. But whenever we see price changes, we have to decompose them into income and substitution effects. So the first thing we do is take that final budget move it up parallel so it's tangent to this indifference curve. That gives us point B. And then we can use what in whatever information we have about the underlying indifference map to find where on that final budget we're going to land. So suppose that we have homothetic tastes. If we have homothetic tastes, then the marginal rates of substitution a constant along rays from the origin, so I can draw a ray from the origin through bundle B, and if there's a tangency here, the marginal rate of substitution will be the same here, and since the budget lines are parallel, we'll have another tangency here. So that would be your final optimal bundle at the new higher price. So that'll give us point C, where you ultimately land. So the demand curve tells us what the consumer is actually going to do, not what the consumer will do if she gets compensated. So the demand curve is going to take that point C, bring it down to the lower graph, and say, well, at this higher price, this is the quantity demanded. And you can imagine we can do this for lots of different price changes, and we can trace out what that demand curve is going to look like or we can just use these two points to estimate roughly what this demand curve is going to look like. So this will be a demand curve for x1 holding fixed income and the prices of good 2. So how does that relate to what we did in the previous module when we derived a demand function for good x1? We said that demand function for good x1 is going to be a function of prices and a function of income. Well, the demand curve holds 
other prices and income fixed. So I'm going to put a little bar above these to say that these are fixed. These are fixed at these levels that we started with. And now we have a function of just one price because we fixed everything else. So this would now become a function of just P1 when we fix the other prices and income. Well, we can graph such a function. Such a function would have P1 on this axis and the function X1 of P1 on the vertical axis. Now notice that the quantity appears on the vertical axis and the price appears on the horizontal axis. But in our demand curves, the price appears on the vertical axis and the quantity appears on the horizontal axis. Technically, the way we graph demand curves is actually not correct. Many years ago, in the 19th century, economists started drawing demand curves with price on the vertical axis. But price is not a function of quantity. The price doesn't change as I consume more or less. It's what I consume that changes as price changes. So the quantity I consume is a function of price. And so if we did this mathematically correctly, we would actually graph demand curves with quantity on the vertical axis and price on the horizontal axis. The only reason we don't do that is historical. We just got used to doing it this way. So this demand curve is the inverse of the slice of the demand function that holds pr other prices and income fixed. When we hold this price and this income fixed, we're just focusing on the slice of the demand function that varies P1, so we just get a function of P1, and then we invert that to get the demand curve. But that's how demand curves and demand functions are related to one another. Of course, if we change the price of good 2, or if we change income, that's going to change the demand curve. If only the price of good 1 changes, we just move along the demand curve. But if either the price of good 2 changes or the income level changes, that demand curve is typically going to be shifting around. Now this kind of demand curve we call sometimes an own price demand curve. By own price we mean that we graph on the vertical axis this good's own price. And usually when we say demand curve we mean an own price demand curve and we just drop the own price. But there are other kinds of demand curves you could imagine. So for example we could draw the relationship between the consumption of good x1 with the price of good 2. In this case, we would fix the price of good 1 and income and just focus on what happens to our consumption of x1 as the price of good 2 changes. We can of course get that from the demand function as well. In that case, we wouldn't hold P2 fixed, we'd hold P1 fixed. and then just vary p2 and then the function would become a function of p2 we could graph that function and we could invert it to create what's called the cross price demand curve and we could similarly derive that from a picture like this where we start with an initial budget constraint an initial optimal bundle and then rather than changing the price of good one, we change the price of good two and trace out what that cross price demand curve would look like. Or we could think of a demand curve that relates the quantity of X1 to our income level. In that case, we'd hold these two prices fixed and we just vary income. We therefore would get a function of just income. We'd invert it and that would give us this relationship. Or we could derive it from a picture like this. We'd start with an initial budget constraint, an initial optimal bundle, and then instead of changing prices, we'd shift income around and trace out what this relationship would look like. And you can already guess what it would look like for different kinds of goods. For normal goods, it would slope up, because for normal goods, as income goes up, 
our consumption of the good goes up. For inferior goods, it would slope down because for inferior goods, as income goes up, we reduce our consumption of that good. For quasi-linear goods, it would be just a straight vertical line because for quasi-linear goods, changes in income don't affect the consumption of x1. So these are the kinds of demand curves we could get out of a demand function by holding two things fixed and just varying one thing. But of course the demand curve we focus on the most is the own price demand curve, which we've derived here.